Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this month's Pathways presentation on project and portfolio management. We have Andrew Clowes, Head of IT from Jones Lang LaSalle, presenting on the topic today. Uh, Andrew is currently the Head of Information Technology for Jones Lang LaSalle, Australia, and the National Director of the firm. Uh, in this role, he is responsible for the development and implementation of the firm's strategic IT direction, as well as the day-to-day -day operations of information technology in Australia, supporting more than 2,000 users uh, in nine corporate offices and hundreds of client sites across the country. So Andrew reports into the Australian CEO and COO. He is part of the Australian leadership team and provides strategic advice on the use and implementation of current and emerging technology. Prior to his current role, he was head of the Asia Pacific Project Management Office, implementing core application projects and rebuilding the application landscape for Jones Lang LaSalle across Asia Pacific. Uh, Andrew is also an advisory board member of the CIO Executive Council and he holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Politics and Industrial Relations, a Graduate Diploma in Project Management and a Master's degree in Project Management. Uh, Andrew, thank you so much for taking the time today to present on topic for our Pathways participants. No worries. Thanks, uh, Kira. Uh, and uh yeah, look, uh, welcome everybody, and I hope you find this informative. Uh, now, uh, one of the things that we are doing is we're going to open up the chat window. So I'd like this session, if, it, if at all possible, to be a little bit uh, interactive. So if there's something that I say or something you want clarity on, if you just type one of the questions into the, uh, into the chat window, I'll be able to uh, try and respond to that uh, or work the answer into the question. Into yeah, the, uh, the, presentation. Other option, the other option that you that all the attendees have as well, if you raise your hand, um, Andrew can take you off mute, so you can speak directly to Andrew. Um, and it's not just if you've got any questions; if you have comments or you just want to have a little bit of, bit of a discussion with Andrew around what he's he's talking to, please feel free to do that as well. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Brent's just typed a question there, which is great. Thanks, Brent, because that's confirmed that the. Uh, the technology hasn't failed us and is working. Uh, I, had my, I had my own set of traumas this morning because uh, my spies in in the building uh, told me that we're about to have a building evacuation uh, test uh, at 10 o'clock, which is exactly when this lecture was about to start. So I had to race downstairs, jump in a taxi and come home. So I'm on my uh, home-based technology. So hopefully everything will work for this presentation. But as I say, please feel free to uh, uh, ask some questions uh, as we're going and, and clarify anything uh, that I speak about and uh, we can uh, uh, make the session hopefully a little bit more interesting and interactive and also tailored for, for you guys. This presentation is, uh, is not about, uh, uh, about me, it's about you getting the most out of it. So I, you know, if you uh, have some questions, please uh, send them through. Okay, the agenda, I've sort of split this lecture up into sort of two, two parts. Uh, the first part is really sort of, you know, stuff around projects and I won't dwell too much on that. I won't teach you to sort of suck eggs on that. Uh, you're all in IT and you all hopefully have a, a pretty good understanding of how projects work. So I will talk about projects because uh, that's what the, uh, the session does do. But really I want to focus on that second part which is the CIO stuff, you know, because you know, when you get to sort of uh, the uh, the strategic level of IT, it's really not so much about just hands on the tools and doing projects. It's out about deciding well, which project should you do, and how do IT projects actually take the business forward? Uh, you know, we don't do projects for the for the for the fun of it. Hopefully, they are fun, but that's not the reason why we do them. We do them actually to to transform the business, to make changes to the business, and so. Uh, you know, I want to focus on how uh, you know I go about that, and, and how some of my colleagues go about prioritising projects and, and some of the bear traps to look out for. So that's the uh, the uh, the agenda that I'm going to run through for this session. Okay, uh, I always like to start my lectures in project management with uh, with this little quote from uh, Nino Machiavelli, and uh, it's actually funny because uh, you know. My initial degree was in politics, and I did study uh, Machiavelli, the prince, 
uh, as one of my uh, reading texts, but uh, had some great stuff to say, which I think uh, uh, applies to project management. It ought to be remembered that there is nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of thing. Uh, I read of that, projects. Because the innovator has for enemies, for all those who have done well under the old conditions, and lukewarm defenders in those who may do well under the new. And I think that sums up what project management is about. Uh, in my experience in, in implementing uh, you know, literally hundreds of projects over, over the you know, past 20 or so years, uh, it's rarely been the technology that has been the uh, decider of success or, uh, or failure. It has always been the people side of projects. And uh, you know, if you take nothing out of this lecture, uh, please take out of it that projects are about uh, implementing change and getting people to accept the change. Uh, and that is, in, I've found in uh, the vast majority of projects, the most difficult piece to deal with. So if you're not a people person, then project management is going to be uh, challenging and, and you probably need to figure out how to become a people person. Okay, so what's a project? Well, you know, this is sort of project management 101 stuff. Uh, you know, you can define a project by time, uh, it has a start and a finish, uh, by cost, uh, and by quality, typically the scope of the project. And that's that's the sort of PMBOK uh, or PMI type standard uh, you know, definition around projects. What does a project do? Well, it brings about change. And as professionals in the IT landscape, our entire business is about change. Uh, it's what we do, whether it's uh, BAU change, whether you're just making a, a minor tweak, or whether it's you know, macro change, whether you're looking at changing the entire organisation. Uh, but a project is always about change, and how well we manage change will define how successful we are as either a project manager or as a, uh, in my case, as a CIO. So what's project management? Well, it's the application of specific skills and methodologies to bring about the change of affairs as defined by the project. And that's sort of you know, pretty consistent sort of uh, definition of project management. Uh, everyone comfortable with that or any comments or questions around that? No? Okay, let's move on. Okay, so these are sort of a couple of definitions from, uh, from, uh, uh, from, well, the first one I've got there is from the PMI. So it's the application of knowledge, skills, tools and techniques to a group of activities to meet the project requirements. So really it's about doing stuff and, uh, and meeting a set of requirements that has been defined by your client. And that client can be uh, an external client or an internal client or it can be both. Uh, and believe me, when it's, when it's sort of both, you, you know, and, we, and we do a lot of projects that are for our clients, but for a particular business line of JLL, and you end up sort of having this sort of split personality because the drivers are not necessarily always exactly the same. And uh, you've, it's a fine juggling act to be able to, uh, to challenge, to, to juggle those, uh, those things. Uh, hang on, am I seeing a question there? No. Okay, sorry, I've just, uh, I'm not on my standard screen, so apologies for me flicking around between screens. So as I said in, the, in this previous slide, projects typically measured in terms of time, cost and quality. And if you want to look up some other definitions of project management as a, uh, as a profession, uh, you can look at uh, PMBOK, uh, have a look through the Australian Institute of Project Management website, or IPMA, uh, International Institute of Project Management. And they'll give you some other definitions. Uh, they'll all pretty much be consistent with, with what I've said uh, there in that slide. So that's, that's project management. That's what the, uh, what the doing of it all is. And sorry, Brent, you've just asked, are there any certifications worthwhile for PM? Well, I, I think there are. And uh, you probably will see on the, on the opening slide, I've got a Certified Practicing Program Director certification, which I gained through the AIPM. Uh, AIPM is probably the preeminent body for project management in Australia, and I think those certifications are worthwhile, certainly because they, they force you under a continuing professional development program. PMI also have certifications uh, for project managers, but I, you know, I think 
as a pure project manager, having a certification is certainly worthwhile, uh, if not for the bit of paper, but also for the, uh, the learning that you gain from other project managers. So I think it is worthwhile in answer to your question there, Brent. Okay, so the project management documents, and, and, and as I said at the start, you know, I'm gonna give you a bit of sort of project management 101 stuff. Uh, and this is sort of the, the general sort of set of documents that I would have for projects that, uh, that I run. So initially, you've got a sort of set of planning documents. So any project needs to have sort of some, in this case, you don't do them typically just because uh, uh, you think about it. Uh, you do them because they meet a, uh, you know, a particular business case. Uh, you'll then move into a, some, some sort of project uh, charter, uh, which is sort of the, the pinbox sort of approach in uh, an agile methodology. It's more like the catalog, but basically you're defining what it is that you're trying to do and how you're gonna do it. Not in the micro detail, but at a macro level. And then you're gonna have some sort of project plan where you can explain to people uh, about that sort of, uh, uh, about the plan and how you're gonna go about executing this particular project. You then have a set of controlling type documents, uh, which is your registers, uh, uh, risk register, issue register, change register, etc., and a communication plan and status reports. So these, these are sort of the, the tools that you use to control the project, but also to let others understand where a project is at. And uh, that's both internally within the project team, but also externally to your project stakeholders. So, you know, as I said at the start, projects are all about connectivity and communication. And, and so it's really important to have a clear set of documents that you can demonstrate that you really are, you know, controlling the show. Uh, you know, oftentimes you're looked at uh, in a project to show leadership. So, you know, you show that leadership by saying, hey, here's what I've got. Here's how I'm controlling this and, and, and make everyone feel comfortable. People are always nervous about projects. And so, you know, you want to be able to uh, uh, be able to show them that you have a high level of control over the project. And then finally, uh, and this is the, the bit that often gets missed out of projects, projects often do drift at the end. You need some sort of acceptance report and some sort of closure report so that the project is accepted. Uh, and, and what I've found in many, many projects is that, you know, they spend a lot of time on the planning, a lot of time up front, uh, and then, uh, you know, reasonable amount of time in the controlling stage, and then suddenly, well, you know, we, we've sort of went live and we sort of drifted into this completion phase and now we're using the product. Uh, and so, you know, you haven't got a clear close to the project. And if you look at those things where I said the timeline on a project has to have a clear in beginning and a clear end, you really want to say, here's the artifact that the project met its requirements uh, and I'm now closing the project. Uh, John, you just asked a question about what's the best approach to inform stakeholders that a project will not meet a deadline. Uh, that's, and that's a good question. Uh, you know, I've found in, in some cases people try and, uh, you know, slide that into a project report and just manipulate and change the dates. My approach is you've, you've got to be absolutely upfront with it when you're going to, not going to meet a deadline and let people know. You know, it, it shouldn't, you know, you, you do a plan, and a plan is just that, but it's not, it's not cast in stone. It's gonna move because circumstances change. Uh, it's gonna move because uh, the scope might change. Uh, it, it's gonna move because there's been a, uh, a, you know, a, a conflict with another project or there's a resource issue. My, my advice to you, uh, yeah, Johnny, in terms of informing people, be absolutely clear as to what the impact is gonna be, whether it's in terms of time, in terms of cost or in terms of scope, and uh, how you're gonna deal with that and what your plan is gonna be, and then recast the timeline. Uh, so, you know, I think you've gotta just have that good relationship with your stakeholders that, that, that they trust you. Uh, some timelines can't shift, and then you've gotta manipulate some other factors, whether that's, uh, you know, increasing the number of resources or changing the scope to meet a particular deadline. Uh, sometimes you just say, no, I don't care. I, I'm not gonna compromise on scope. Uh, 
uh, and therefore the timeline might have to increase. But you know, work that through because you know, as a project manager, you're sort of conducting the orchestra. You're not necessarily playing all the instruments and you're not the one who's responsible or you're not the one that uh, determines the sound that comes out of the orchestra. So what you've got to do is make sure that your stakeholders are involved in that decision. And then you agree on it, document it, undertake a change request and we have a, in JLL we have a formal change uh, request process that we go through uh, in a project if we, if we are going to change a deadline or, or not meet a deadline and we get that signed off. So we make sure the steering group are aware of that and they accept it, uh, accept the implications of it and then sign off on that. Hopefully that answers your question, Johnny. Okay, uh, Johnny says that it does, so great. Thanks, Johnny. I'm glad that uh, met your uh, requirements there. So tracking the projects of, of, a, of a project. So, you know, this is, this is really basic sort of Microsoft project planning stuff. Uh, and I like, you know, I see other, other people often, you know, track things in Excel spreadsheets and various lists and that. I find, I'm a very visual person, I just like the Gantt chart way of tracking a project. But you, yeah, you can come up with your own way. But generally speaking, it's the project plan. And I've said they're typically a, a planning tool like MS Project or Primavera, something like that, that can graphically show you where, a, uh, where the tasks are in a project and how, they, how each task interacts. So, uh, you know, whether it sort of uh, shows, whoops, sorry. Uh, you know, you, you need to understand what the, uh, the timeline is and what the prerequisites for a particular task are. So task A can't start before, you know, task, you know, uh, B and C have been completed. Uh, and who is responsible for that particular task? And you can show all of that in some sort of project plan. Uh, as I say, the key components of that, uh, you know, the resources that you're going to use, what the key activities are, what the milestone dates are, what the project phases are, if any, and what effort is required for each one. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of you know great other planning uh, logarithms built into systems like MS Project, but I find that most of my stakeholders really just focus on the Gantt chart rather than the the detailed sort of uh, workings uh, within the bowels of uh, Microsoft Project. So that's sort of how I would typically track a project. So in the project timeline, uh, you, you know. This is basically the same sort of uh, tart. In Microsoft Project, you've got some great tools that will really help you. And it means you can keep all of your information in one place. And I've just highlighted the, the information button there. And you can put in there notes. It will tell you when you've got resources that are over allocated. Uh, it will give you information about the particular task. And you can type a whole bunch of information about particular tasks. It's a great way of not only informing your project team, but also informing stakeholders at a at executive level. And, uh, sorry, and sorry, just going back to a question that uh, that you'd ask earlier, Brett, on the uh, executive qualifications, quali project management qualifications for an executive. Look, you, you, you really you don't you don't absolutely need qualifications as an executive, but you know, real really having a qualification actually gives credibility to some of the things that you do when you've got to make hard decisions. Uh, so. I guess you know depends on you know how you feel. I mean, you know, I'd I've been running projects for many many years before I got a master's in project management, but after I did, it gave me a lot more credibility when I was running projects, uh, and uh, and and helped me also learn a lot about uh, other methodologies to use. Okay, uh, other things that you'll see in in a Microsoft project type timeline, uh, uh, you know, the resources, and this is showing here, those resources showing in red, that there's an over allocation uh, of resources. Uh, in this case, person one is over allocated in this particular project. Uh, you can show who is un responsible for undertaking a particular task, uh, and you can show the length of a particular task in the project, how long that particular task is going to take all great ways of communication. As I said at the start, projects are about communication, uh, and that, that's no different from whether you're a project manager or whether you're a CIO. Uh, you've got to be the master communicator to let people know what you're doing, how you're doing it, and, and uh, you know when it's going to be done. Okay, status reporting. 
Uh, you, you know, we, we talked a little bit earlier about keeping people informed, uh, and I find that a, a single, a simple status report is the best way of doing that. The way that I run my projects uh, within JLL, all of our project managers do a standard template uh, approach for their status reporting. And whilst there are plenty of tools where you can do that sort of online, I do find that uh, a pretty simple Word document with some traffic light indicators is probably going to get the attention of the stakeholders in our particular organisation. Uh, uh, so, you know, uh, where I've sort of uh, leaned to is a, uh, a sort of a standard two-page report and then we generally produce that monthly in most of our projects and that is handed out and discussed at a, uh, at a project steering meeting. So you can determine the frequency of it in you know, short projects, it might be uh, you know, more frequently than, than monthly, uh, you determine that frequency. But it, you know, the, the, the key is uh, you know, fit for purpose when you, uh, when you determine the frequency. Uh, the reporting format, as I said, you know, I use a, uh, a word type document but I cover the key things, What's, what activities are coming up, where am I at in terms of traffic light reporting on, uh, on particular you know, areas of cost, resourcing, schedule, risks and issues, what activity has been completed in the previous month or previous period and what activity is coming up. So as I've said there, standard inclusions, traffic light indicators, what are the key milestones, what are the completed activities, what are the planned activities, what are any risks and issues that are coming up and then a bit of a financial summary, where am I at in terms of tracking? And how you present that is really uh, dependent on the audience. I, you know, I, I used to do a standard PowerPoint presentation. I found that uh, some of the stakeholders, the executive stakeholders, really wanted just a single sheet with a bunch of traffic light indicators and then talk to that. Uh, whether you make that online, whether you make it paper, whether you make it a series of dashboards, you really got to work with your stakeholders but you know, as the project manager, you want to make sure that you are sort of making sure that everyone is informed of the key things about the project. Does that make sense to everyone? Hopefully, it does. Uh, I'm just going to get rid of a few of these questions so I can see my any questions coming up. Rightio. Uh, Onto some thoughts on methodology, and this is sort of where it gets uh, important from an executive level, from a CIO level. It, you know, as I say, one size doesn't necessarily fit all projects, and you need to understand that because I've seen people go down a path where they've had an absolute focus on methodology and really has missed out the key things of of managing risk. So you know, make sure that the methodology suits the project. If it's a multi-million dollar, you know project that's going to take two years to run, well you want to make sure you've got a pretty sound methodology around that. If it's a short project that's going to run for a month, well then don't overcook it with documentation because you know all you're going to do is spend all of your time on documentation and before you know it the project's sort of done. Uh, you still need to have a minimum amount but don't think you have to have every document. The way I, I deal with that because we get uh, internally audited on all of our projects, I have a check sheet uh, which the project manager goes through at the start of a project and they decide what documentation they're going to use to control their project. And they might say, well, we're going to have a, an abbreviated project charter, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to do monthly status reporting, we're just going to do a, a, a single status report uh, and we're going to have a closeout document and, and not much else. Um, so you, you have to have a, uh, an approach that makes sure that you're comfortable as, a, as an executive driving projects uh, that are going to make sure that the projects stay on track. So as I say there, the actual documents, tools and approaches will vary but the general principles are, un, uh, are common. You've got to have the requirements, you've got to have some level of planning around the project so that you can communicate that with your project team and your stakeholders and vendors. Uh, you've got to have some way of controlling it, you've got to have some way of reviewing it and you've got to have some sort of closure. So. That could be 50 separate documents that you have, I would not recommend that, uh, or it could just be a couple of documents. Uh, so look at the document, documentation and methodology from that perspective and be flexible. Uh, and, and that's where experience you know, comes to play because if you know the full methodology, then you can you know, cut that back. 
to make sure you've covered the key risks. And you know, as a project manager, you know, you really want to understand risks and where risks arrive uh, in your project. Okay, that's uh, about all I have to say on methodology. Is that making sense to everyone, hopefully? Right, a few, a lot, a few yeses on that, so that's great. Okay, the next bit I want to talk about is the sort of the CIO uh, part of projects, and this is sort of that executive view of projects. So, as a CIO, projects are part of your suite but they're not the, the only part of it. You know, you are responsible for the management of change. Now, that's not in the IT organisation, although you are responsible for that, but you're often responsible for the management of change across the whole business. So you're the one that's got to really align and prioritise those projects with business objectives. You know, we're there to serve our business uh, and therefore we want projects that, uh, that align with the business. And not every uh, every child gets a prize. So not every project is going to make the cut. You've got to then prioritise which ones give you best bang for buck and which ones are going to uh, move the organisation forward. At the same time, as a CIA, you've got to keep the lights on. You've got to do all the boring stuff like, uh, you know, uh, server replacements and patchings and, uh, you know, change requests and all those kind of things that, uh, you've got a whole bunch of other stuff that you've got to do just to keep the organize, organization running. Uh, you've got to also be responsible for project governance. So to make sure that your projects do have the right level of governance in place. And you know, I'm very firm in our organization about projects. If I don't have a, a clear business stakeholder that has put their hand up for the project, uh, and is really, really forcing that they want it, uh, then I won't let the project go ahead. So unless I've found, you know, absolute accountability within the uh, the project stakeholders, rather than just sort of wishy-washy, uh, oh yeah, I wouldn't mind getting this done, uh, then I won't let the project happen. And I'll talk a little bit about the uh, the RACI matrix, and that's the sort of responsibility, accountability, uh, consulted and informed matrix, and you've probably seen that in other other scenarios, but uh, I'll show you the one that, that I use. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what to look for in projects as a CIO. Uh, Johnny, you've asked a question about do I have any tools to identify uh, uh, which projects will provide the most business value. Look, there are some, and I'm going to show you an example in a later slide that uh, a colleague of mine uh, when she was at, uh, at PepsiCo used to prioritise that. I'll show you that, but really you've got to come up with your own for your own organisation and what is valuable to your own organisation. It's not that hard to do, to come up with that, uh, so you can do it, uh, and I've got some tools that I use to do that. So I'll answer that question as we move forward, uh, Johnny. Uh, hopefully, if I haven't answered it, then uh, please raise your hand and, and uh, make a comment. Okay, projects, management of change. Projects are about change. And all too often we forget that a solution de delivered on time, on budget and to business requirements delivers zero value unless people adopt the change in their daily work. And this was a, uh, a comment made by Catherine uh, Smithson uh, uh, and I went to a lecture of hers uh, a couple of years, well, 18 months ago at the Australian Institute of Project Management here in Brisbane. Great lecture and it was all about change management and that is one of the key things that often gets missed in projects is that people side of it. Because, you know, in the slide from Machiavelli earlier, you know, I said that people don't really like change. They, they are resistant to being changed. So you need to take them along that journey uh, and make sure that they do adopt the change because uh, people will always go back to their old uh, approaches if they can avoid making the big mindset change. That's because people have a, a fear of change. Often it's not actually a, a, a fear of change, it's a fear of being changed, like being changed in the way that they do things. So you've got to take them uh, along that journey and sell, sell the, the reason why they need to adopt that change. Uh, unfortunately, most organisations are not uh, dictatorial, so you can't just say it's my way or the highway because you'll be white-handed every time. You've got to take people along the journey and that's 
where you've got to build trust with uh, with your stakeholders. As a, as a CIO, you know, I find that trust is probably the most important commodity that I trade in uh, because if I, you know, can in, engender people's trust uh, as to why we're doing something, they will come along with that journey. And uh, absolutely, uh, the dictatorial approach just does not work. So change management, if you are involved in any form of project, please uh, Google uh, Catherine Smithson uh, in her firm Being Human or just look up change, change management because it's a key thing that's often overlooked in projects. So uh, you'd ask me that question, Johnny, about uh, you know, uh, aligning and prioritising projects. Uh, here's a couple of key indicators that you would build into some sort of matrix and you know you could easily put a scale to any of these questions uh, and then rate rate the project often you know that first one capacity of the organization to absorb change you know I've said we shouldn't go ahead with a particular project because there's just been too much change in the organization you know we changed our ERP a couple of years ago uh, from a, a, an SAP environment to a PeopleSoft environment and at the same time, we had another business unit that wanted to make a significant investment in a particular project that was going to affect a lot of people. And I said, look, the organisation is just change weary at the moment. You know, it's a good, great project, but let's just let's just change when we do that. If we do it this year, uh, in the particular year we're talking about, I think it was 2013. If we were to do it in that year, we're almost guaranteed a failure because people are just weary of uh, of change. So. Capacity of the organisation to absorb that change. Look at the entire portfolio. Look at what's happening across the entire business, and how many projects you've got underway. It may well be that you're completely overworking the infrastructure team, and your projects are going to fail because you're simply not going to have enough resources to be able to do that project. So you got to look at uh, you know the whole project and try and align it. Uh, you know the capacity of IT to support the change. Uh, you know once you make the change. You've then got a lot of uh, you know, hand-holding to help people with the new uh, the new change, uh, with the new technology. So you know, you've only got limited resources to be able to support that change. Examine the strategic fit. How does that fit with your goals? Our company has a, a what's called a G5 strategy, which is our global uh, goals for the firm, and every project gets rated against those. How does that fit in with the global strategy? Uh, we do do some projects that don't absolutely fit in with that global strategy, but in the main, we can link back a particular project to a particular uh, global strategy. Uh, examine the technolo technological fit of the project. You know, if you're a uh, if you've got one particular technology stack in your organisation, and someone wants to put in a completely different technology that doesn't really fit in with your standard stack well then you might want to rate that project down a little bit or consider re realigning it. Uh, as I say, with limited dollars, not every project will make the cut. Uh, is there a sound business case? We use a return on investment approach for, for the vast majority of our projects to make sure that it does actually stack up. You know, you know we're, not, we're, not, we're not doing it unless there's actually a solid business case uh, for either our clients or for uh, our financial return on the project. And finally, as I said in my earlier slides, is there a clear sponsor and owner? And in brackets, not IT, uh, unless it's a you know, IT project. But uh, you know, most of the business type projects, I want to see an absolute clear sponsor that is really going to jump up and down about making that project happen and really drive it because they've got to drive that change into their organisation. Uh, when you've asked a question within your organisation, do you have an organisational PMO that helps prioritise projects and have you found PMOs to be worth the investment in the past? Uh, that is a really, really good question. I am going to talk a little bit about PMOs and my experience with uh, PMOs later, but just to answer your question, yes, we do have a, uh, a PMO. I used to run that PMO. And I, in fact, I set it up uh, in Asia Pac. And, you know, it was during a period of massive change in the sort of mid-2000s in the organisation. And, uh, you know, at any one time I probably had uh, you know, 30 or 40 fairly complex projects on the go at the time. And the PMO at that time provided absolute value because I had limited resources and I had to prioritise projects and make sure that 
you know, we could actually achieve them. Uh, so it had absolute value. At the moment, we do have a PMO. It's now based in Singapore. I don't, I don't run that PMO. Uh, I do get some resources from it, but pretty much in Australia, you know, I, I run my own sort of uh, ship now. And, and unless the project is a, uh, a regional or global project, I really don't call upon the PMO. I kind of have my own pseudo PMO uh, in Australia, uh, which is basically my, my head of projects runs with that. Uh, and then he uses that to, and uses PMO type principles uh, to prioritise the resources. So look, you know, uh, I guess I've got a, a, a kind of a virtual PMO now. Uh, it's not just this huge bureaucratic organisation. We're In JLL, we're a very, very lean sort of IT shop. Uh, and I sort of run PMO type principles, but I don't have a dedicated PMO that's just got, you know, bench capacity with, you know, 30, 40 project managers sitting on the bench. Is it worth the investment? Look, I think it just depends on the organisation that you've got. If you've got a really big card of multiple projects with multiple conflicting resources, then someone needs to be able to deconflict the resource usage. Uh, in in our case now in Australia, that's me uh, and, and my head of projects. Uh, but if in, in some very large IT organisations, a PMO definitely has value. And I'll talk a little bit about that later, Owen. Thank you for that question. That's a, a, a really good point on PMOs. Whoops. Sorry, uh, uh, you'd asked that question, Johnny, about uh, project evaluation criteria. And this is one that I, uh, I took from uh, Jackie Montado. She presented on this Pathways presentation back in 2013. I've been doing it for the last couple of years. And, and this was sort of a, uh, a, sort of a, 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 a scorecard that she had used for projects. Uh, just particularly in the uh, in this area. So, you know, what was the project value? Uh, this is just one particular one. What is the reward out of it? What's the financial benefit? So in our case at JLL, it's an ROI calculation. What's the strategic fit? Uh, the enterprise strategic fit and the business unit strategic fit. So rating that there on the score of, you know, one to five or however you want to do it. What is the risk of the organisation? And what is the capability of the organisation to actually run with it? So there were the three things that she had used for uh, for project evaluation criteria, and, and I think they're pretty sound sort of things. If, if you're not going to get a, a big tick against those particular categories, then really I wonder should a uh, uh, should a project proceed. I've just seen your comment there. Oh, and no worries. So thanks. I'm glad that that answered your question. Oh uh, yeah. So you know that's sort of one way of looking at evaluation. If you Google it, if you go and have a look at some of the resources out of AIPM. Uh, you will find multiple uh, project evaluation criteria sort of scorecards that you can uh, you can use and adapt to your own organisation. Okay, keeping the lights on, the other part of the uh, the CIO land. Uh, you know, great that we do projects, great that we do you know big strategic things for the organisation, but you know what? If someone rocks up in the morning and their email doesn't work then they don't really care about how fantastic your ERP implementation project is. They just want to know why they can't get their email. So as I've said there, IT projects rarely happen in isolation. Um, and there'll be other impacts on the project, uh, such as change freezes. You need to work that into your timeline. Technology changes, infrastructure capacity, uh, security considerations. So you've got a whole juggling act uh, as a CIO to make sure that your normal BAU activities are happening, uh, but also that uh, you know you're you're still implementing good projects. So I won't tell you pretend to tell you that that's easy, because oftentimes it's the same resources that are keeping the lights on that you also want to work on your projects, and you've got to deconflict that. Uh, that is an absolute juggle, uh, particularly if you're in a relatively small IT shop like ours, ours is, uh, that you know, you 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 don't have dedicated people that only work on projects. Oh no, sorry, I don't do BAU infrastructure. I only do project infrastructure. That that's rare these days, and I think will become rarer. So, you've got to juggle that, uh, and you have to keep asking questions. Uh, you've got a sort of other risks that are coming that may not even be part of your project. You've the one that's got to deal with that. So you know, uh, yeah, 
each of you are doing this pathways course because you know, you're on a pathway to that sort of executive leadership. You may well already well you may well already be in that position, but you know it is a a juggling act, uh, and it, it that that's that's my whole life is uh, about juggling juggling stuff to make things happen. But you know that's that's where the job gets exciting because uh, you are the master of change, uh, of changing the organisation. That's an exciting place to be. And I, you know, I can tell you the, the way that technology is moving these days, uh, being in the driving seat for digital transformation of your organisation is an exciting, fast-paced place to be. It's uh, a lot of fun. However, uh, I won't tell you it's all fun because things go wrong. And you know, uh, you would have seen the Queensland Health Payroll uh, Inquiry and the subsequent report into that. Uh, monumental uh, uh, stuff up in terms of an IT project. I won't go into who was right and who was wrong in that one, but uh, my God, uh, if things can go wrong and, uh, and turn sour, that is a classic example. Uh, NT government, $70 million there, the Royal Commission into the Home Insulation Program. Uh, the Obamacare website in the US, like yeah, you, you just see these things happening all the time. You know, I've sort of been uh, fortunate, I suppose, that most of the projects I've been involved in uh, at JLL have uh, have gone pretty well. And maybe that's because they're they're nowhere near as complicated as some of these big projects. But you know, you you, know, you can't help to think that how did any of those projects get to a point where it just seemed to have gone belly up in a heartbeat? Uh, you know what kind of controls are in place, and uh, you, know, you can make your own judgments on those. But I would encourage you to read those. I mean, uh, reading about what's gone wrong in projects is a great way to learn about uh, you know how you should do things and learn from lessons. You now we're all about in IT uh, learning le learning lessons. So uh, if you can you know learn from other people's mistakes and avoid them in your own projects, that's great. And, and look, I, you know. I can tell you a consistent theme in, in a lot of these project failures was the stakeholders just had no idea what was going on. Now whether they didn't ask the right questions or whether the project manager didn't give them the right information, I don't know, but the key stakeholders in all of those projects on that slide there uh, really had no idea uh, where their project was uh, failing. And I'm sure each one of you has probably experienced projects that have uh, Going belly up or gone belly up, uh, it's not a not a fun place to be. Our project processes, and look, I put this slide up there uh, simply because it's a it's a really a word of uh, caution. And uh, this document here that I've referenced, and I won't go into all the detail. You can you can read it. That's I've put the source there of where I got that slide from. But basically, they said that. Just because you've got these fantastic levels of documentation will never guarantee project success. And it says that the top of that uh, little chart there, even the best process crats underperform. And this was all about you know recruiting the, the bright project managers. But basically what it's saying is project managers or project processes, which are all based around process, uh, regularly underperform. So just because you've got a person that is great at process and great at documentation won't necessarily mean that your project is going to succeed. So as I've said there, choose your project managers wisely. Because what you really want are people that are great communicators and people that can see the bigger picture. It's important to have appropriate documentation, but absolutely more documentation doesn't guarantee success. Without the appropriate documentation, it will almost guarantee failure. I can I can tell you that, but just having more documentation won't make your project more successful. And what this survey did, this uh, uh, project management effectiveness diagnostic did, it found that people that were able to uh, communicate, people that were able to really engage with the business, had a higher level of success in their projects. So I would commend that to you if you get a chance to. Uh, to, uh, to have a read of that, uh, that, that document. Uh, the RACI model, I'll quickly go through this. Uh, this is a, a tool that I use around my projects. Uh, I also use it in my uh, 
uh, uh, business as usual uh, sort of activity as well. Uh, and you know, basically it just makes it very clear to everyone who's responsible for uh, various aspects of a, uh, of a project. So you know, I take uh, uh, each, each uh, participant in a project and then I identify a role for them in that. So responsible, they're the doers of the work, accountable, they're the owners of the work, consulted, they're people that need to give input before work can be done, and informed, people just need to be kept in the picture. And every single person in your organisation that's associated with a project should fit into one of those categories. And it's a, it's a great little tool to, uh, to go through uh, when you're looking at who are all the players. And I'll give you an example of, uh, of that. Uh, when you raise a question, do I have any, any tips on how to raise the level of stakeholder or executive sponsored competency within an organisation but without stepping on people's toes? Yeah, look, uh, the last bit you said there about without stepping on people's toes, uh, key point. Uh, look, what I find is I do have a, there is a document, uh, I haven't referenced it here, and it basically tells people what is expected of them in a project uh, in a project steering group. So I've got a few little pop-ups coming up there. Uh, and uh, if you if you Google it, project roles, I think it's called, uh, you'll find some stuff that that will really help you and, and make it very clear to people what you expect of them. And I make it very clear in my projects uh, at the very first steering committee. Hey, by the way. Uh, you're not just turning up here to get informed. You don't have an I against your name. Uh, you have an A against your name. You, you know you're accountable for the delivery of this project. And uh, you know that if they don't want to be on the steering group because they don't want to be accountable for it, then you know find somewhere else to go. But that team is responsible for delivering and driving that project. So uh, yeah, tricky not to step on people's toes, but you've got to make sure that people are making those decisions and. You know, a funny, a funny thing, Owen, Owen about uh, you know raising that competence. Uh, you know, I get people to physically sign off on project charters as the the business owner. Uh, so pretty much everyone on my steering group has actually signed the project charter, so they understand what they're accountable for. And you know, it people these days can weasel out of things in emails. You know, you send them the charter, and they'll send. They'll, you know, here's the project charter for project X, and you'll get an email back that'll say, "Yeah, all looks looks satisfactory to me." So they haven't said if they accept it. They said it looks satisfactory to me. It's kind of a weasel word. So what I do is I print it out and say, "Sign here. Put your actual ink on the paper and sign it that you accept this charter and this scope and these risks and all these things." And there's no weaseling out of your signature. You can't put a caveat on it, you just got to sign it. So I do that as, as one of the key things I do. But then I also inform people as to what I expect of them on their role. I'll go on to this next slide, Owen, because hopefully that will give you a bit of an idea as to how I communicate that. So this is a sample racy matrix. And, and look, I just said, here's, here's a bunch of activities that are going to happen in this project. And I've put along the stakeholders or some of the participants in the project along the top there, the chief operating officer, the sponsor, the project manager. So in, say, activity, into activity one, the COO is informed, uh, the sponsor is consulted, the project manager is accountable. Uh, we've got some consultation with the application lead, the infrastructure lead. Uh, you know, so that's how I go through it. So whatever those activities happen to be, uh, really great little tool. Uh, so they sign off on that as well, that they understand. Okay, these are the things that I'm responsible for. These are the things I'm accountable for. Okay, they're going to ask me and consult me about certain activities. Uh, other things, they're just going to send me a, I mean, I've been informed of it and that's it. So a great little tool. That will hopefully also assist you, Owen, in, in, in raising that competency because you take them along that, that journey about what you're expecting. But, you know, I, I use my, my project steering groups to educate uh, stakeholders as well. Uh, and I need to keep going because I'm getting close to time on this. So project governance. And this is a key thing as a CIO. It's more than just documentation. Uh, it's about sponsorship and ownership. It's about having the right balance of controls, audit and management around the project, having the right skill sets. And you alluded to that, Owen, in your question, you know, making sure that your you know, key stakeholders have got the right skill sets. 
having right frameworks for risk, um, making sure you've got responsibility and accountability. And look, there's a, uh, some useful references that I've put there around governance. I'd encourage you to read those. Uh, they're both quite uh, useful. Uh, yeah, the, Royal, the report of the Royal Commission to Home Insulation, one of the major failures there was one of governance. So that is a great little document to read because there pretty much was no governance. Uh, but please have a read of those documents. You've got access to these, uh, these slides, so you don't need to write it down. Uh, and Kira will uh, have these available on the website anyway. Uh, as I say, what to look for in a project, strategic fit, capacity to change, capacity to deliver. Is there strong ownership for the project? I can't highlight that enough. Uh, if there isn't strong ownership for it, you shouldn't do it. Uh, sound methodology and robust governments uh, are some of the other key things that you need to have around uh, your project. Establishing a PMO, look, we did talk to that and I, I alluded to what I've said there about the fully fledged PMO uh, or the virtual PMO, which is the, the, where I'm sort of at. As I mentioned, well, I think it was uh, you, Owen, that asked that question. Uh, you know, it depends on size, complexity and the spread of projects and the size of the IT organisations. But either way, PMO principles still apply, whether you've got this sort of virtual PMO that I sort of have or a fully fledged PMO with, you know, you know, bunch of the project managers and infrastructure teams and all that, uh, those principles still really do apply. Uh, so that is it from me and I think I'm pretty close. I'm about four minutes on uh, time. I'm happy to sort of, uh, if you've got any more questions or want to clarify things, I'm happy to go through and, uh, and bring that up. Uh, Johnny, you've asked a question there. What has worked for me in helping users accept change or measuring change positive or negative. Uh, yeah, look, we do, we've do. we got a formal way of doing it. it. I won't say it's wildly successful, but we go back to projects uh, usually one year. We set that in the project charter at the start. Uh, we go back and re we review the project and we go through a, a post-project survey uh, to try and understand that. You know, what, what I always tell people, in most of our larger projects that, you know, don't accept wild adoption in the in the first year, and really that comes after the second sort of iteration of training and, and rollout in that project. Uh, it's it's a it's a tricky one, uh, but you know I find that the whole approach of you know you know when you give a lecture you know they say if you want people to understand a message you got to tell them, and then you got to repeat it, and then you got to tell them again, and basically saying you got to you got to go through th things three times basically. Uh, so to get people to accept that change, you've got to go through a few iterations. Almost guaranteed, they won't accept that change on day one. They will. Uh, they will need some help along the way there. Uh, that has worked. Our going back and trying to measure financial benefits has always been pretty tricky on most of the projects I've found. Uh, yeah, Johnny, you said training, training, training. Absolutely, uh, you've hit the nail on the head there. It is all about reinforcing that message. People generally accept new technologies and that once they feel comfortable with it. Uh, but what I found is the more senior people are in an organisation, uh, the more embarrassed they are often about their uh, uh, lack of tech of tech savviness. I don't think tech savviness is a word, but anyway, you know, you know what I'm saying. Uh, so you know, some private sessions are often good. I, I do a lot of uh, closed door sessions with. Uh, with some of our senior leaders to make them comfortable with the change and then they feel happy to cascade that down to their organisation. Uh, so you sort of got to attack it from, from both, both angles uh, to get change to happen. But uh, please go back and have a look at that, uh, that Being Human website uh, from Catherine Smithson. Uh, some great stuff about change and, and how to do that and, uh, you know, big projects, I would absolutely engage with a change manager uh, like, like her organisation. Uh, I'm just going to get rid of a few more of these questions to make sure oh, I haven't missed any. Uh, Andrew, I, I think you, I think you've answered all the questions that came through and that, that was really good. Um, I'm great that everyone uh, had a chance to ask the questions as, as we were going through the webinar. Um, 
I think we're, we're pretty much set to wrap up unless anyone else wants to make any additional comments or ask anything before we close. Um, otherwise, we do have the Q&A coming up on the 26th of April. So if you can send me um, via email any additional questions that you have for Andrew um, and just ensure that you register for that session, that would be great. Um, but Andrew, thanks so much for taking the time um, and for presenting on the topic. I, I think it was a really good session. Yep. No problem. It's my pleasure, Kira. And look, as with all of the stuff that we do via the uh, the CIO Executive Council, you can always uh, either uh, connect up with me on LinkedIn or send me an email. Uh, happy to help you on your uh, your journey, uh, your pathway. Uh, so uh, you know, please keep in touch. Hopefully, it was beneficial to you all. That's great. Thanks for that offer, Andrew. Uh, and thank you to everyone that attended. Um, we will speak to you all shortly. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you all.